we will start this morning with uh, or she with Savannah, and then Elizabeth will talk, and then we'll have uh, what is it? Uh, Charlotte. She will be the last. Euh, donc, on va commencer avec euh, Servan, puis on va, genre, euh, ce sera Elisabeth qui va parler, et après, ce sera Charlotte. Et euh, on va garder la question and answer à la fin. Parce que, euh, elles m'ont ont expliqué que les trois sont liés. So, we'll have the question and answer session at the end, because the three interventions are interconnected, and it's, yeah, it's better to ask questions at the end, so please keep your questions in mind. Um, this morning, I'm really pleased to introduce three young researchers, female researchers, I have to insist, uh, and they're at different stages of their career. So, one is still writing her dissertation, one uh, has submitted it, and will in a week will have her defense, and one is already a postdoctorate student. So I'm really, really keen on uh, seeing uh, how this uh, will have an influence on their talk. We'll start this morning with Seven Monjour. She is a postdoctoral student at the Département de Littérature de Langue Française of uh, the Université de Montréal. She works as a Digital Textualities Canada Research Chair, and her focus is on a new methodology of image in the digital era, and she is the coordinator of the digital academic journal Sans Public. Thank you. Uh, so, hello everyone. Uh, I would like to begin my presentation. Can you hear me? Okay. Okay. I would like to begin my presentation with a little experiment. So first, let's pick up a picture, for instance, a photo of the Eiffel Tower that I found on the Wikipedia page of the French monument. Now, let's give this picture some character or some soul, because uh, it seems a little bit too encyclopedic and soulless. I will use the free software Pixel Aromatic available online. Pixel Aromatic is a photo retouching software very easy to use that proposes a large set of filters or images into vintage pictures, or more exactly, into fake vintage pictures. You can see that the interface is a digital representation of a dark room or what we imagine a dark room should look like. The scenography is not only an aesthetic trick, I will explain why. So firstly, the arrangement of the colors through a digital representation of the developing bath forged on the screen by means of a skeuomorphic design in order to faithfully recreate the sensitive experience of the photograph. The cursor, as you just saw, even creates a wave simulating the impact of the end on the liquid surface. I choose a black and white filter, uh, which gives the digital image the appearance of an analog picture. Secondly, the digital patina got by the layer called metal, perfectly aging my picture. Eventually, let's remove these two sharp and regular edges the tone effect of the filter called Femtom will do the job. In just a few clicks, my digital picture that used to illustrate the article on Wikipedia is transformed into a beautiful image of an analog photography, forever failing to become a real analog photography. My picture was soulless, now it seems soulful. Despite all technical coherence, this new picture is some kind of uh, technological barbarism that refers to a mix of cultural, discursive, and imaginary representation of the photographic medium, all being as important as the technical properties of the silver film. A digitally analog image embodies the problems related to the remediation of photography. What are the aesthetic and heuristic states of such a manipulation? Are we giving the image an extra aesthetic value or more photographicity? 
by manipulating the image in this digital darkroom, can we become photographers without ever holding a camera? Despite all its efforts to look authentic, is my picture unauthentic? What does this experiment say about the ontological issue of the photographic medium? I would like to draw your attention to the scenography of the interface. The dark room, this mysterious and mystic space, has always raised many fantasies and is deeply linked to the ontological issue of photography. In French, the term révélation refers to the chemical process by which the latent image, invisible, is transformed into a visible image. This notion of revelation, revelation has played a major role in the constitution of the medium's, medium's mythology. Indeed, the photochemical process has always nourished the concept of photography, lending all sorts of powers to images as if the camera could surpass the faculties of the human eye. Revealed into the darkroom, pictures were themselves summoned to reveal reality. This connotation also exists in English. Henry Fox Talbot himself already associated the development process with the idea of revelation. In The Pencil of Nature, he notes, for what a denouement we should have if we could suppose the secret of the darkened chamber to be revealed by the testimony of the imprint paper. Also, by copying analog pictures, digital tools are not only imitating and remediating <coughs> old media, they are calling in the concept of reality, of, of, of what we consider to be an authentic representation of reality. So considering this notion of revelation, I will try to understand the paradox of photographic remediation, since the digital medium doesn't seem to let go the good old analog photography, which won an unexpected popularity thanks to new technologies. In this context, the concept of remediation, as forged by Bolter and Gerson, does not seem to be sufficient to describe these complex relationships between the old and the new medium. Also, the traditional theological reasoning, according to which, and I quote uh, McLaren, a new technology tends to take as its contents the old technology, so that the new technology tends to flood any given present with archaism, seems may be simplistic. I would like to demonstrate that through this paradoxical remediation, analog photography is also being reinvented, um, enriched by new connotations that modify our global conception of the photographic medium. In other words, what I want to say is that before digital photography, we ignore what photography truly was. So in this period of major technological transition, Everything suggests that we should be observing the remediation of photography. But after our little experiment in the digital dark, dark room of pixel aromatic, we can wonder which one of the analog or the digital medium is taking its contents from the other. After having experienced a massive economic crisis, analog pictures are winning a new popularity, both formally like with pixel aromatic and technically, technically uh, today some companies as a lomographic corporation are remarketing silver film cameras. Our experiment shows that there is a constant dialogue and intercontamination between analog and digital, which are often opposed within this theological conception that we frequently meet throughout the history of media. But it is almost a reversed remediation that happens as a digital deliberately incorporate afterwards in post-production some analog effects. Remediation is thus synonymous with pastiche and appropriation, not only an appropriation of forms, but also of old photographic objects, which have become precious artifacts for collectors. This playful logic of remediation is very problematic because it's not only a strategy of integration of an old media into a, a new one, it's also a strategy of creation. Let us consider again our retouched image of the Eiffel Tower. Who is its author? 
simple manipulation which does not require any technical skills, not even computing skills, making me a photographer. This is a ma major issue in the second digital revolution. Photography in the age of the web 2.0 is not about mastering the digital camera, but was rather about dealing with the photographic material on the internet, this new space for sharing, storage, and infinite manipulation. Cycling logic encourages us to question what it means to practice photography, whereas we no longer need the camera to shape images. In their work on the concept of remediation, Bolter and Gerson distinguish two main strategies in media evolution, which generally operate in concert. On the one, on one hand, immediacy sets up a process of eraser of the medium, which becomes transparent to give the viewer the illusion of a direct access to reality. The paradigm of revelation is deeply linked to this idea of photography as recording or as an index. And on the other end, the principle of hypermediacy focuses on opacifying the medium to underline its formal marks, what we could also, also call its noise. The conflict between immediacy and hypermediacy is increased in the case of the photographic medium, torn between high-resolution quantitative injunctions and what we could consider as useless traces of the analog medium such as the noise of the shutter release on our mobile phone. But we've seen with our experiment that the reliability of an image also depends on the connotation associated with the medium, connotation that can be materialized, vintage or false vintage effects. This authentic artifice reveals that an old media sometimes earns a new signification at the moment of its disappearance of, of or is a pseudo disappearance which paradoxically shows it as we had never considered it before indeed analog photography does not simply transmit <coughs> some of its peculiarity to the digital medium it reinvents itself in contact with a new culture in other words digital photography has also partially and retroactively invented analog photography if the concept of remediation emphasizes the presence of an old medium in a new one, it does not address the question of the transfer from the new medium to the old one, or in this case, from digital to analog. To think this complex and anachronistic relation or phenomenon of reverse remediation, I will propose the concept of retromediation. To understand the concept of remediation and retromediation, as I do, we must consider that the medium is a technical construction as well as a discursive construction. Once again, technology is equal to mythology. In the light of these two concepts, the analog photography is no longer this charming, obsolete ancestor of digital photography, seeing the latter contributes to the analog photography's transmission and even more to its reinvention by injecting new functions a posteriori. For instance, some technical imperfections of the medium, which engineers have tried to fix for many years, are now transformed into meaningful plastic properties. We must understand that retromediation is not synonymous with the return of an old medium or with the resist resistance to a new one. Today, every image, even an image of the past, is under the influence of the contemporary photographic gaze. I would like to illustrate this concept of retromediation through the notion of analog effect that refers to lo-fi or false lo-fi, false vintage practices. So since a few years, the photographic forms of the past are very trendy. We can buy old family album, albums in antique shop and they're more and more expensive. Some old cameras are commercial, commercialized again and there's a lot of uh, web communities dedicated to the subject. The damaged, chipped or faded photo is a, is a consumer product as much as an argument used for commercial purpose. Um, you have here a commercial use uh, that use that kind of um, graphic design. 
analog has, all, has become an effect, not only an aesthetic effect, but also a semiotic and poetic effect, even a political one. Also, we won't be too surprised to see how these effects are massively present in the digital practices, which, using software like Pixel Aromatic, restore a so-called cachet of authenticity to some picture to claim to be true. The cornerstone of this phenomenon is a simplification of manipulation procedures, which already existed at the age of Nips and Daguerre, but which now takes advantage of the development of digital tools. Color filters, texture and framing effects let us, tr let us travel through the different ages of the medium. Of course, these manipulations imply some approximation, anachronism and technical barbarism, as in my uh, little experiment. Because that kind of software focuses on the mythology or on the imaginary of the past photography, rather than on the past images themselves. These effects certainly testify to a nostalgia for the darkroom and for the connotation associated to the photographic process. Also, what, we could be, what could be considered as a remediation process based on imitation actually underlines major semiotic functions. Proving its heuristic efficiency, the analog effect now makes recurrent appearances in the press, yet hostile to any form of manipulation. Of course, this incursion provokes some debates, and photographers or editors are, are often asked to justify themselves in a context where digital technologies, photophony, social networks, sharing software, have transformed the work of the journalist. Photo reporters to use uh, a software like Pixel Aromatic. The professionals are divided. In an article published on the CNN website, the photographer Nick Stern expressed concern over the success of what he calls false images, considering their authors are imposters who haven't spent, I quote, haven't spent hours in the darkroom leaning over trays of noxious chemical until the early hours of the morning. The disappearance of the darkroom, of which Nick Stern defends quite a romantic representation, would be synonymous with the disappearance of photography. The computer operation would be a photographic treachery in which the image of reality disappears in favor of the aesthetic of the image. Some photo reporters have been trying to adapt those, uh, these popular practices without betraying the journalistic ethics. For instance, Damon Winter, Benjamin Lowy, and Karim Ben Khalifa three very famous, uh, famous and awarded reporters have traded their uh, professional camera for a simple iPhone with the application Ipstamatic in order to cover, to cover respectively the Afghan conflict, the Libyan revolution and the manifestations in Yemen. Their photophonic reports have been relayed by well-known newspapers such as the New York Times or Le Monde. All three have worked with an iPhone, a low-cost device, small, light, and discreet compared to professional cameras. All three agree on this point. On the field, an iPhone is a real asset. It's a familiar object that allows them to blend into the crowd closer to the action. Damon Winter, who made a report in a battalion of American soldiers, just on the screen, doesn't hesitate to consider his iPhone as a guarantee of objectivity. In front of the iPhone, the soldiers were not tempted, tempted to pose as in front of the professional camera. Damon Winter, Benjamin Lowy, and Karim Ben Khalifa also recognize the semiotic function of their iPhone and of the retouch software, which guarantees both the construction and the efficacy, efficacy of information. To the one who accuse them of privileging the aesthetic of the image at the expense of the informatic mission, the three photographers answer that they also document contemporary strategies of documentation for which the plastic form has become more important than ever. 
This is why, more than a symptom of nostalgia, the success of the analog effect would involve a sharp awareness of historicity to which is attributed a plastic and a photographic form, a vintage or a false vintage form institutionalized by application like, like pixel aromatic or hipstamatic. The analog effect is an authentic artifice, a sign of historicity that gives more intensity to our pictures mm -hmm. and takes part in a process of desindexation of photography. This process takes us back to the ontological status of photography. What happens now with the paradigm of revelation? So to understand the consequences of this phenomenon of retromediation, I would like to propose the concept of anamorphosis, and I will conclude on this proposition. Etymologically, the term anamorphosis means formed again or formed back. It indicates a distorted projection or a distorted pers perspective requiring the viewer to use special devices or to occupy a specific vantage point to reconstitute the image. In the 17th century, anamorphosis more precisely describes images hidden in other images. Albain's ambassador is a canonical example. In other words, this classical anamorphosis play a, of a principle of, of revelation, inducing a rupture with the linear perspective of the Renaissance. What I retain from anamorphosis is its heuristic and ontological model. In the perspective of as a symbolic form, Panofsky argued that the invention of Renaissance perspective had favored a rationalization of the gaze which completely disregarding the real condition of perceptual experience, had replaced the space of perception by a mathematical space regulated by the rule of geometry. In of the invention of this linear perspective, there is an effacement, an erasement of the medium of representation as a window on the world. The anamorphosis comes to break this objectivation of the world and replaces it by a multiple conception of reality, which can be sometimes paradoxical. Anamorphosis is what I have been trying to draw from the beginning, a conception of the medium in which technical and discursive facets from the present and from the past coexist. Eventually, anamorphosis is a mode of relation between media, one gives meaning to the other, and so on. Like crystal, it is impossible to see them together, yet impossible to envisage, envisage one without the other. In this way, the concept of retromediation refers to the presence of a medium in another one, a medium, <coughs> anamor a medium anamorphosed into another medium. Thank you. Alors, merci, Serval. Uh, our next speaker, are you ready? Uh, our next speaker is Elizabeth Roussier from the University of Montréal. Uh, she has just, yeah, how can I say? <laughs> <laughs> it says file, but submitted, I think, would be a better term. And she just revealed to me that uh, we have to keep our fingers crossed because in a week she will defend her thesis. So good luck to you. She has been working on a poetic approach to intermediality and remediation since her master's degree. Uh, and uh, she has published in Canada in uh, French and international journals about intermediality in literature often bridging with digital humanities uh, um, and uh, she's a member of the Canada Canada Research Chair on Digital Sexualities and her research has been funded by the Quebec Fund for Society and Culture and by Canada, Canada Social Sciences and Humanities Research Council. We'll now talk as you can read yourself about disappearance towards a theory of hypermediacy. So it's yours. Thank you very much.
so now my communication is made to follow Servan's propositions in a way, but I will concentrate on issues that emerge from a more poetic approach uh, to phenomena of remediation. So I will therefore interrogate the so-called paradox of an authentic artifice through the lens of the idea of disappearance. And to do so, I will dive into the realm of magic using the Nolan Brothers movie, The Prestige, as an example. So why disappearance? Uh, well, from an interminable stance and regarding a specific object or individual, disappearance allows us to throw an interesting lens upon certain processes of remediation and mediation since our attention is monopolized by the presence or by the knowledge of the object or individual. So I'm going to start by drawing the outline of an intermediate approach to the figure of disappearance. And more specifically, I'll talk about what disappearance produces so that we stay within the very logic of a paradox that isn't one actually. Indeed, I find it more interesting to question what I call the productive aspect of disappearance over its negative ones, uh, like absence, erasure, obliteration, and so on. Adopting an intermediate stance before the problem of disappearance indeed allows a glimpse on a particular mode of interaction induced by disappearance. And this mode of interaction that I conceive as being immediacy's counterpoint, I shall call it quite simply hyperimmediacy. Um, actually, my research on disappearance have been initiated by the study of a formal phenomenon that got me to put together a few literary texts and some movies. I gathered works that had frequent intermediate references, according to uh, Irina Rajewski's well-known terminology, which means I was looking to works uh, using their own means, or their own writing, or their own work on images to convene perception schemes uh, conventionally related to other modes of mediation. Uh, this phenomenon is quite frequent, frequent and has been pretty popular too among uh, intermediate studies since like 2005 or so. But more specifically, in these works that caught my attention, intermediate references are very strong and pregnant, but furthermore, uh, they are included or surrounded by an important meta discourse about various phenomena of remediation. So, brought together, and I mean the, these strong intermediate references and the discourse that intensifies their impact. These two features inform an actual poetics of remediation. That is to say, the works produce and thematize at the very same time remediating processes such as borrowing, refashioning, quoting, or repurposing in, in sometimes very significant or even violent ways. And a uh, blatant example of that would be uh, the way 16-year-old runaway Dora Bruder from Patrick Modiano's homonymous book is disseminated in a plethora of documents that are actually remembering and suturing the Jewish girl that disappeared some 76 years ago. So her birth certificate, a wanted notice published in a newspaper or picture descriptions, among other things, are remediated by and in Modiano's writing. And in doing so, as he also includes himself, his own memories, and a reflection on the performative aspects of writing, Modiano thus builds a written, composite, and performative environment or milieu for Dora Bruda to be again, despite her disappearance, and for her to stay within the realms of existence and becoming long after the time of her own. Uh, in a movie like the Nolan Brothers, The Prestige, remediations gain a stronger visual aspect, of course, but they are not merely represented. They interact with different filming features and with editing and narrativity uh, more specifically. Indeed, in this movie, uh, as I will show later, the interaction between the magician's tricked diaries and the veracity of the images and events we are shown gets complicated to the point where it all tends toward an intermediate creation. But what struck me the most reading and watching these kind of work, well, this kind of works, and focusing, focusing on issues of remediation, is that they were all related at some point to a modality of disappearance. And then a very complex question emerged. Why is that so? Why does this connection between remediation and disappearance exist in numerous works? And what can this connection tell us? Well, first of all, I guess it means that disappearance and mediation or 
remediation of portieri are intrinsically linked, of course, but how and what do we do with this correspondence? So I went on with the analysis of a few works, every one of them putting to the front this connection between disappearance and remediation, whether it's in an obvious and explicit way or not. And my first thought was to approach the problem through a broad logic of interaction. So interaction between the medialities at play in the processes of remediation, interaction between objects and mediation, interaction between what is said to be gone and what stays, and more importantly, uh, between what is said to be gone and its own problematic becoming through acts and resistance of mediation. So text, moving or still images, archives, letters, newspapers, pictures, and so on. Um, each and every level of interaction I identified always happened not only because or thanks to mediation, but rather inside and through it. In a case of disappearance, the only possible relations or interactions occur within the realm of mediation, no matter how strong the desire for immediacy can prove to be. And actually, this desire for immediacy, being this impossibility, impossibility of all impossibilities, is precisely what leads to the emergence of this particular mode of interaction I propose to call hypermediacy. Conceived as uh, immediacy's counterpoint, hypermediacy thus refers to a mode, and not, not only a formal mode, but but I, yeah, in the interaction, on, I'm, not, I'm not only talking about what happens in, in the books, but in like real life too. <laughs> uh, <laughs> so an interactional mode in which the only possible relations occur within, um, within mediation, just, just like what's played out in the works I analyzed too. But the interesting thing is in, in this logic, mediation does not serve as a mean of representation or neither does it become a channel to the disappeared object. In the logic of hypermediacy, mediation becomes itself immediate, or at least it becomes a space in which immediate and essentially performative interactions occur. So according to what I noticed in the words I observed, uh, the problem of this appearance is in fact constituted by these three interconnected terms and none of them coming first. That's important. Uh, this desire for immediacy, the disparation itself, and the hypermediacy that defines the mode of interaction surrounding it all. Because there is essentially no disappearance without desire. And here's what's, what the prestige tells us. Making something disappear isn't enough. You have to bring it back. But as this uh, symbolization with the birds show, Mm -hmm. Bringing back something that disappeared isn't merely possible. Borden here, Borden, that's the guy, uh, he shows a little boy this bird that is said to have returned after a disappearing illusion, uh, but the following cut exposes the truth. A first bird actually had to die during the turn. So of course an identical return is a chimera. But still the injunction of the bringing back remains and its impossible fulfillment is what makes disappearance last forever. There is no end to a disappearance or else we talk about death, we talk about absence and etc. But the idea of disappearance lies in the irremediable conflict between desire and impossible knowledge, impossible reference, impossible certitude, impossible immediacy. <laughs> And these conditions thus ri give rise to hypermediacy, the only possible way for an object or individual to return, but in its hypermediated form. Uh, so disparation, desire for immediacy and hypermediacy inform a complex that emerge all at once and together they actually create their object, they produce it. Um, in other words, and with all the problematic aspects that come with this assertion, the object and it's becoming within a hypermediate set of interactions. Uh, so with the, uh, with the separate, you know, with dispersion, what no? <laughs> Sorry. we find ourselves in front of an ontological redistribution and a strong temporal reconfiguration. Okay, now let's go back to uh, to the prestige and to the authentic artifice, or more precisely to the authenticity of artifice. And to be honest, I was, I was not so happy with the title of this conference because it kind of stole my analysis punch. Because <laughs> I argue that one of the main discourse uh, emerging from the movie is that 
the authenticity is to be found within the explicitly unauthentic. So I, I said that before. <laughs> <laughs> and that is to say, uh, in the art of this, or more specifically in the movie's logic in Illusion. I will concentrate on the character of Alfred Borden and on the way his own disappearance affects not only his body, but the idea of it, his authentic self as well. Uh, yeah, the, the relation between disappearance and hypermedia is quite interesting within the prestige because we step aside from a logic a priori easy to grasp where something disappears only to be brought back by means of mediation because the magic shows imply that disparition becomes an actual space in a very conflictual space actually and also because this very disparition must be reiterated in the cycle of representations indeed there is this significant tension uh, throughout the movie between the idea of a staged representation or in virtually repeated time and the deployment of a larger performance unfolding in the personal and social spheres. Uh, Alfred Borden, one of the two main characters, stresses this out when he talks about another magician who needs to spend his life pretending to be a cripple, according to the movie's words, while the truth is quite different. So pointing this seemingly old man when he's off the stage, Borden says, and I quote, this is the trick. This is the performance. This is why no one can detect his method. Total devotion to his art. A lot of self-sacrifice. So what Borden is telling us here is that the real trickery is not to be found behind or under the stage, but in the performance of everyday life, in the performance of an illusion that embed the representations. And that the price to pay for a good trick is this total sacrifice of the self. And the sacrifice of the self get, gets even more important for the two main characters as their careers rely on a trick called the transported man, which implies that the magician's body disappears at some point to be brought back again quickly elsewhere. But making something disappear isn't enough. You have to bring it back. Yes, but how can you possibly bring back something that disappeared? How can you bring back? How can you bring back the same? Because I, as I said before, identity is absolutely impossible. You cannot be the very same man before and after a disappearance. And the reason for this is not merely because disappearance changes something in an identity's trajectory, but more significant, <coughs> significantly, there's no before and no after to a disappearance. Disappearance is intrinsically anachronistic and cannot be represented on a straight timeline. Uh, I already said that disappearance produced desire and hypermediacy, but these dynamics don't come after the moment of disparition. They are always already there waiting for a subject to make their experience. So basically, in order to perform the disparition on stage, in the space of representation and in the cyclic temporality related to the shows, the magicians need to possess two bodies at all times, like in the performance of those personal and social spheres too. Two bodies, but one self, in order to be the same man despite the spatial temporal shock of disappearance. So the question is, how can one achieve that without falling to the logic of the double? Either kills you, remember the birds, or is this clear enough? Well, it's a man on their stage. Uh, so, so the double either kills you, like the brace, or steals your prestige, gaining complete power over you. So this is a magician taking his bow under the stage, while his double has the privilege to see uh, the public's reaction. Just recall the bars of the cage in which the bird previously died. Uh, so regarding this problem, it is interesting to see how Borden uses his diary or notebook as a space for this necessary dissolution of the self before the hypermediate process of singularization, uh, before this occurs on stage. So he uses uh, a space that is conventionally made to be a space for an authentic expression of the self, like a space for inner truth expression, the diary, to merge magic and non magic to merge representation and performance, but above all, to merge the identities 
of the twin brothers that constitute Borden's jewel. They both take turns in writing the diary, calling I and myself this dual entity, assuming the impossibility of ever knowing their own truth. <coughs> At some point, he writes, for example, I quote, I quote, I fought with myself that night, one half of me swearing blind that I tied a simple slip knot, the other half convinced, convinced that I tied the link ring double. I can never know for sure. End of quote. So with this denegation of a possible truth, we find ourselves in front, in front of a personal document used as a performential process of denegation of an identity's core, a process of sublimating authenticity. And to paraphrase Borden again, this is the trick. This is the performance, <clears throat> the sacrifice of, his, uh, of this inner truth that could possibly jeopardize the success of the transported man re by revealing its secret. So thereby succeeding in dividing his self into two bodies, it becomes possible for Borden to disappear and return, still being the same man. And just to come back a little on the problem of the narration, it is interesting to know that uh, the spectator gains access to this diary through another character's reading of it, as he himself writes his own wicked diary. This embeddedness of the trick notebooks is mostly what triggers the narrative sequences and thus the images that were shown. Uh, that way, the diaries not only do they call into question the characters. Um, the character's sincerity and interiority, but also they are responsible for the blurring of the image's truthfulness and authenticity as well. The prestige is entirely built upon a falsifying narration where true and false, authenticity and illusion, and even time structures become absolutely indistinguishable. So in this economy, is there an authentic space at all? Well, as I mentioned before, in the film's logic, the only authenticity is to be found within the explicitly inauthentic, where all, where all the falsifying processes converge. And that is on stage, where Borden performs his illusions. So on the stage, conceived as the hypermediate space towards, towards which the different medial processes of, of Borden's production of his illusionist dual self Converge, uh, his authenticity finally shows. The authenticity of a man whose very nature is precisely a becoming illusion. The stage is indeed the only space where the two bodies merge into a single identity, where representation and performance may merge, where cyclic and linear time merge, and where authenticity and artifice merge as well. Gordon himself, himself becomes an authentic artifice produced by intermedial means. <clears throat> so this particular configuration of the relation between disappearance and hypermediacy is not the easiest or the most schematic one uh, to circumscribe these concepts as I understand them. But I think it shows the, sh the strength of the paradoxes, conflicts, or oscillations inherent to hypermediacy. <coughs> <coughs> Sorry, when it comes to think of the productive value of disappearance. So the dispersion in, in the prestige produces a conflictual space, which is the space of the secret or the trick. It produces a second body, but most of all, the dispersion produces the hypermediate self. But at the same time, this hypermediate self actually needed to be already there for the disappearance to take effect. So disappearance is, once again, intrinsically anachronistic, but most of all, I guess it is intrinsically paradoxical. That's it. So we're coming to our last lecture this morning.
Je vais, je vais juste passer avant que tu... <rire> je veux pas que tu disparaisses, justement. Non, tu n'as pas disparu. Je n'ai pas disparu. Je n'ai pas disparu. Non, Okay, are you ready to start, Charlotte? I think so. Good, I have the. Uh, oh, we don't see anything. Where's your PowerPoint? Here yeah, it is. Here it is. So, now we come to Charlotte Grenier. Our, she is a doctoral candidate in the program at Cinematographique at the University of Montreal. She works on a research and coordination auxiliary for graphics, techness, and for the chef research <coughs> du Canada on the cinematographique et ludotique. Um, she's actually writing her dissertation with André Gaudreau and Richard Dujan. And I guess what we are hearing, what, you are, what we are about to hear now is one of the chapters of your dissertation. No? Yeah. Okay, well, great. So we'll hear it's a, something. It's a brand new here. thing for me. Yeah. <laughs> uh, she will talk about uh, Yearn digital between intermedia aura and absence. Presence. So, hello to every real human being in the room. Um, I'm curious, um, does anyone uh, have saw the um, exhibition, the touring exhibition? Okay, so I have free hands. Perfect. <laughs> <laughs> so, Throughout the career of this Icelandic experimental singer who keeps in dancing intermedia designs, Björk's eccentric aura assumes unprecedented facets. In this continuity, she transformed the Nikura, released in 2015, into the first virtual reality album with the mean of Björk Digital, a current touring exhibition. Moreover, during the London opening ceremony, Björk revealed herself in real time from the Technology Institute of Reykjavik in Iceland thanks to her artificial avatar playing her own authenticity. Furthermore, she asserted to the Guardian last summer, I quote, the older I get, the more I understand what is special about how we experience music. It's either one-on-one -on -one or thousands of people at a festival when you lose yourself. It's not intellectual, it's impulsive. Virtual reality is a natural continuity of that. It has a lot of intimacy. As a musician, to be intimate is really important. I experimented Björk Digital during this um, venue at DHC um, Art Foundation in Montreal uh, last October. And because it is my first outline about virtual reality, my communication develops an empirical approach uh, in the light of um, a kind of dialogue between contemporary scholar theories. That's according to this specific example, I will question the notion of aura, issues of absent presence in virtual reality. I will also aim to understand the paradoxical yet tangible sensory effects that such an apparatus enables and the limits of its artifice. First of all, the big question, how to define the notion of aura? Beyond the well-known paradigm of Walter Benjamin, let's consult the pragmatism of the online Oxford Dictionary. So the origin, with no surprise, comes from Latin and Greek, meaning breeze. First, the distinctive atmosphere of quality that seems to surround and be generated by a person, thing, or place. Two, a supposed emanation surrounding the body of a living creature and regarded as an essential part of the individual, or any invisible emanation, especially an odor. Three, a warning sensation experienced before an attack of epilepsy or migraine. The French online language dictionary adds, and yeah, when I speak in French, the personal translation for English speaker is on screen. Bande de lumière entourant les êtres humains que pourraient voir les médiums et dont la couleur varierait selon l'état spirituel du sujet. Björk a en mise en scène, in each album, like so many transfigured faces, 
is the perfect reflection of this definition to me. All these representations of herself are energetic traces. The remoteness, the stimulus, the simulacre of her unique presence to borrow Derrida's expressions. Thought with the approach of Abby Warburg, interpreted by Didier Berman. L'être de l'image consiste à former dans un style un fond d'empreinte originaire. Au niveau temporel, cette opération s'appelle survivance. Warburg la nomme souvent prise de corps. Il apparaît donc clairement que selon Warburg, les puissances de l'image, puissances physiques et plastiques, travaillent à même le matériau sédimenté, impur et mouvementé d'une mémoire inconsciente. The posthumous life, the relic, the aura, is unsettled in the digital era, which merges human and technology, abandoning the truth to the benefit of the plausible, through the prism of decomposition, recomposition, and coding and coding. And Philippe Marion set out in their conference yesterday. With the advent of new aesthetics, ideals, and or media practices, the artifice does come alive in a more and more believable and realistic way, confronting the subject to their possible future. These issues and the cyborg metamorphosis have been haunting the heart of Björk's artwork, where her identity, conception fluctuates and the body's representation gravitates endlessly around her unique voice. According to Gwenaël Tison, a French people, a morphic technique does not imply alienation. Considéré dans un registre réaliste, le morphing ne dissout jamais un corps avec son environnement proche ou lointain. Bien au contraire, il conserve la corporité de l'individu, sa permanence picturale, tout en créant artificiellement l'évolution possible que son enveloppe charnelle peut subir au fil du temps. En somme, Cela rend signifiant, signifiant le moi pour. Le morphing assurait la manifestation visible du caractère fluctuant de la surface de la peau. Gunikura being the painful artistical uh, tradition of both her separation from her husband Matthew Barney and her chaotic pathway to resilience, this extract from the video cover of um, the VR album is the perfect, the perfect symbolic example. the very essence of her feelings paradoxically inhabits a virtual world and runs under, under a pixelated um, skin. In this blur between the, real, um, the realm of fiction and reality, the words of Daniel Boulou concerning the presence came to my mind. Cette présence réelle inquiète quantité d'autres représentations, au cinéma par exemple, quand un acteur se trouve distribué dans son propre rôle. Ces espèces de collages contestent furtivement une distance représentative sujette à d'iconiques retours du réel. Ils ébranlent de l'intérieur le régime rassurant, idéalisant de la fiction. So now let's explore the elements of the exhibition. George considers that Vunicula is a helpful material to work in VR because of its old-fashioned heartbreak saga. The narration is the most stubborn of my albums, so I felt it could take on the experimentation of where VR is now benefited from the 216 bit. And because of Bunicola is one singular self pitying voice, to work with many directors gave it more point of view. 
This Turing exhibition with a work in progress characteristic depending on the phase of contents compressions includes a DG set for the openings, a video installation of a single black lake commissioned by the MoMA, a screen projection called George Cinema made of 29 uh, from her most famous video clips, the iPads to explore her biophilia. But above all, the exhibition shows five music videos from the inner of Jock's mouth to the Icelandic Rift, um, made by Huang, Konda, Euclid, and Thorson Jones. They are shot in uh, 360 degree and conceived to be watched um, with a VR headset Oculus Rift, um, though most of them are now available on York official YouTube channel. I just suggest you um, a little insight into two of them. So, neither Björk's costumes nor Björk's digital itself are exactly the same from time to time, and thus she aims to create hybridized live conditions of music listening. Indeed, small groups of visitors are formed and supervised. Every member has to be synchronized with the others to fully watch that vi VR videos a single time. And if the Oculus Rift is removed, the content is gone. This is why this event is described as a, a, a part performance, exhibition, film, digital installation, which merges music, visual art, design, and technology. But this letter is still at its early stages, and despite Björk's ambition, as far as I experience, and according to critics such as Mark Hudson for the Telegraph, the result does not really correspond to the promise. For example, in fact, um, most of the contents, uh, for most of the contents, you only remain um, at the surface of the images, and you, you cannot enter into it by pointing up with your eye. Or um, there is a kind, also um, a kind of um, lack of interaction with other within the set, or even with York, um, and you often face a kind of relatively low uh, resolution sometimes. But it's also good, but there's a small, you know, skepticism. The awkward timing and scenography, which uh, constantly break the fluidity from room to rooms between VR artworks, also contribute to a certain discrepancy with the promotional discourse of immersion. Joe Max reported for The Guardian this classical technophile utopia, which collides technology's reality. It's hard to let yourself completely into the other words, given the chunky VR bridge strapped to your face and the relatively low resolution and occasionally out of focus graphics. It also reminds the audience of how accomplished video and film as our form of interpretation. By comparison, the visible pixels and the weird relationship between camera and viewer during the VR experience feel almost primitive. Mark Zahn made the same observation, but a bit more nuanced, for the Telegraph, but described this vivid VR encounter with Bjork. An avatar of the singers appeared with its back to us like an incandescent digital diagram, and so close it seems to be merging physically into us, breaking it to a mass of exploding rainbow colored sparks that literally floods the senses. The effect is at once alarmingly 
um, and quite awe-inspiring. So it's uh, one of the extracts I showed you just before. Don't know if you see, feel the same. Indeed, despite the feeling of um, imperfect transparency, to borrow the famous term of Bautel and Lucy, a different feelings of presence do emerge. We will try to understand this paradoxical phenomenon in this last foreign part. If qualifying term for the VR technology and the images power of fascination mentioned by the journalist evoked to me the early cinema and its power of attraction, of catching the attention. This theory developed by André Godreau and Tanganing highlights the discontinuing narrative and exhibitionist dimensions with direct gaze and address to the spectator. So for the, the preservation of your ears, I need to put you a video um, version. Um, but there's um, a real um, 360 degree for the, the second one. So the true face jerk. The spectator is literally targeted, incorporated in the film by emphasizing the presence of reception. This process recalls the moving pictures roots deeply linked to the theater and mass culture. According to these two researchers, so uh, André Goudreau and Tanganis, this capacity of attraction generating a specific aesthetic that reaches first the sensations and emotion does not come from the narration, but rather the apparatus. Edmond Couchot named this paradigm technesthetic. Je cite, une nouvelle technique figurative n'entraîne pas forcément un nouvel art, mais elle fait surgir les conditions de son apparition. La perception. Elle agit sur l'imaginaire. Elle impose une logique figurative, une vision du monde sur l'opérateur qui, en retour, est façonné, modélé à son insu, par ces techniques à travers lesquelles il vit une expérience intime qui transforme la perception qu'il a du monde. Rien que ça. <rire> This technological relationship is inhabited by a persistent fantasy of emergency and presence. Nevertheless, as Bolter and Grissin demonstrated, the desire of media transparency is paradoxically accompanied by media opacity, a media of which the film goers of early cinema remain conscious, but did not restrain that power of belief as commenting Tanganing. The audience member knew at one, le once, one level that the film of a train was not really a train, and yet they marvel at the discrepancy between what they knew and what their eyes told them. On the other hand, the marveling could not have happened unless the logic of immediacy had a lot of the viewer. There was a sense in which they believed in the reality of the image. This porosity for boundaries between fiction and film and reality in the emotional construction is also at the heart of the series of Carl Platinga, Platinga, I never know how to pronounce it, in moving viewers, camera film and the spectator's experience published in 2009. In his cognitive perceptual theory, he makes room for automatism, memory traces, learned associations and considers that belief is in, in, in real, in reality, is not essential to emotion. Thus, he goes beyond the paradox of fiction by asserting the role of the body. Bertrand Gervais describes the familiar media experience of a tangible feeling of presence as follows. La singularité du moment est l'immédiateté du sentiment qui l'engage. L'événementialité de l'apparition est l'impression ressentie d'y être plongée. La continuité requise aussi pour que cette présence se fasse sentir. Car il ne peut y avoir de présence et d'apparition que si, dans un premier temps, il n'y avait rien. La présence est, on peut en douter, l'effet qu'un spectateur, absent lui-même, ressent quand son esprit capte une étincelle de vérité ou de vie, là où il n'y avait a priori que des pixels. So, to conclude, 
or increasing media practices transform our imaginary day after day and they also reconceptualize the notion of corporeality. For example, the sun abolishes the spatiotemporal caesura and gives tangible form to fictional presence, especially in the case of music. Sonore qu'émerge l'être sonore singulier, la chair de l'audible, as Nickel Dufresne lyrically wrote. With her in instantaneously recognizable vocal tone, Björk is able to transport us into her own universe. The experience of being immersed is in an ineffable atmosphere while listening to music, surrounded by sound images with our own mental and sensory projections, can thus be compared to VR while reading Martha Nijuis. Nijuis, I think about the effects of Oculus Rift perception. Nous sommes par là projetés vers l'image que l'image vers nous, transformée en fantôme qui flotte dans l'image comme s'il se trouvait dans sa réalité, sauf qu'il ne paraisse pas sur les miroirs, parce que, pour reprendre Deleuze, notre actualité est désormais hors champ, nous devenons des êtres virtuels. But according to researchers, as Joseph Ferral of Gider Simondon, our aesthetical sensory relationship to the world always need a technical mediation and the granted trick of transparency depends on habits of perception and if the spectator's expectations are attuned to media capacity. I have then on mind this declaration of Björk's during an interview for The Guardian during June and uh, during his June. I see myself as someone who builds bridges between the human things we do every day and technology. Mm -hmm. We now better understand why and how she uses the timeless VR images to express her grief. According to Bertrand Gervais' theory about digital presence, ce dernier apparaît alors comme illusion d'une figure qui surgit et semble réelle. And so is the illusion of love myth with all her aborted connections with her husband. And so are our frustrated attempts to fully interact with her in her VR experiences as she keeps hunting us untouchable and mystic. As observed Mathieu Guillot in La Voix Comble de la Présence, Il nous faudrait opérer une séparation temporaire entre voix et visage, les désolidariser, afin de considérer la première dans une autonomie suffisante et non sous la perpétuelle dépendance d'un corps qui la conditionnerait. Being a pioneer, it is precisely for her art's sake and the shake of our habitus that Dios has kept spreading the exhalations of her aura between the sensory and the intangible with innovative transmedia hopes. Thank you. Okay. Thank you very much, Elizabeth, uh, Charlotte, and Servan. We're coming now to the question and answer session, and I hope uh, you're, you get inspired by the three talks, and uh, you have Lots of questions because uh, yeah, we, we could talk until noon. <laughs> wow. Uh, <laughs> I have two questions, if I may, for, yeah. for two different people. Uh, I'll start with Charlotte since it's so fresh in my mind, but uh, yeah, maybe we want to close the projector for the presenters. Oh, yeah. <laughs> I think, yeah. Is there a technician in the booth? Uh, so my first question for Charlotte is on this idea of presence and the photo you showed of the several people watching the exhibit as, or the VR experience at the same time. And they're technically all occupying the exact same position within the VR scape. So I'm wondering if you've thought about this idea of they're all occupying the exact same space, virtually, but different space physically and the problems with that. And my second second question for Servan is, I'd like you to maybe uh, expand upon the fact that it seems to me that these practices are dying out. The, it seems like they were most relevant with the rise of 
skewer morphism with the beginning of cell phones mm -hmm. that we're now moving to like 360 photos or something like extremely forward thinking. And with the fact that routers as um, now disallows any editing on photos, it seems to me that there's a move away from this kind of editing. So I'm wondering if you could expand on that. Okay. So yes, first of all, you, you cannot forget um, the others because you are constantly touched them because <laughs> you're trying to, you know, uh, reach job somewhere somehow. And so yeah, there's a kind of um, friction between bodies, but I think it's the same when you when you attend a, um, a concert, maybe. So it's a, there's a kind of um, real body communication with by by the touch. So you you can feel the the, the temperature, the you know the of, of of someone just close to you, and and the magical trick is that yeah you you are connected in reality to your body, but you also connected to a single fragment of VR um, in, in experience. So it's a, a kind of two way of being present and um i think it's what is um the, the main uh, i think the main angle of this exhibition of vr uh, uh, exhibition and vr music in fact as a uh, bjork uh, conceived it i don't know if i yeah okay so uh yes i am um, a few years ago um there were pretty more uh, photo reporters doing that kind of, of work. But um, I do not agree with you when you say it's over and now we're going to do something new. I think uh, in photography, in literature, in anything, we are not doing anything new. So you, ha uh, you had a few years ago a very, um, very visible uh, or retromediation, it was very, you know, very formally uh, expressed, like something very, very visible like this. But it's not uh, today. We have maybe more accepted the fact that uh, we cannot really doing something new. But we are trying. We are trying to reinventing, reinventing what we did before. So I won't be so sure uh, um, about the fact that uh, we're doing forward and about this is the, um, the argument of it's uh, you said read, readers uh, mm -hmm. um, that not allowed to edit uh, pictures today i you have uh, i think a big difference between what uh, readers or uh, um, the uh, of the award for uh, or the photojournalism um, Best picture every year is saying, and what are the practices? I think uh, you still have today on Instagram or on uh, on uh, that kind of uh, sharing software a lot of uh, vintage, post vintage, playful uh, picture. Um, in artist uh, artistic uh, practices, you also have playful and. Uh, and this dialogue between the old uh, and the new media. So I would be very uh, careful uh, about the discourse uh, of uh, writers or, or the, I can't remember the name of the huge prize of uh, huge uh, over the photography uh, photo report, reporters uh, best picture but you have always a huge debate between the the fact that the um, picture has been has been uh, edited you know they, they try to forbid editing but it's always a construction a picture is always a construction so uh, yes. so i have a question for the three of you i think the common basis of your presentation is the gaze staring for photograph it's clearly movies as well and VR and uh, quoting uh, Nietzsche 
when you see them, when you stare at the abyss, the abyss which stares back at you. I think since you, uh, the three of you have uh, underlined the, the craving the, for authenticity, for reality, or identity, or truth, with the aura, the desire, and the, um, in the photos, for example, the, the search, the struggle for something that is real, like time passing. What I, I, I'd like to ask you, and the, the opposite, so disappearance, the hypermediation, remediation, retromediation, searching for aura, looking for, you know, for the, from the point of view of the subject. And the other end, what are the basis, the milieu, uh, to say the French word, the milieu where disappearance and aura come, come from? <laughs> 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 Thank you very much for your simple question. <laughs> okay, I, maybe I can try, yeah, maybe in French. Yeah. French version to be and a short one. Yeah, because that, that was uh, just my last question. You know? kind of. <laughs> <laughs> just the last part. You have talked about three dynamics at the base. Ma question is, d'où naissent ces dynamiques? Donc, les, les dynamiques, <rire> les dynamiques regard... la, la dynamique de la rétromédiation, de, 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 de l'aura et de, 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 la, de la disparition. Okay. Parlant du regard, c'est que toi, tu voulais suggérer que le regard était peut-être le lieu d'émergence de ces dynamiques-là, que finalement... On... Le regard, c'est que vous avez parlé de, de, ce, de cet effet d'un point de vue, mais l'effet des de, de médiations, l'effet de, de la disparition, l'effet de l'aura, etc., ont un impact sur les sujets qui regardent, mais en même temps, ils naissent de, 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 de quelque part. Peut-être de sujet, de regard de sujet. Ah, c'est là ma question. Si j'avais une réponse, <rire> j'aurais pas posé la question. Your question is about, it's also about origin. I mean, where does it come from? Because, um, uh, or how? Yeah. How they come from? The emergence, not necessarily an origin or a birth. Yeah, but it's, I think it's a big issue we're working on because where does it come from means is there an origin? And I think we're trying not to get there, trying to think at a dynamic. So, but I, I, you started your question talking about gay, saying that it may be what, uh, what like brings us together. I, I'd say it's more desire. Uh, I think desire um, traverses <laughs> our speeches, and um, of course, desire can be. Like closely to to gaze, and you know that desire is a production. Uh, so I guess, I guess we could say like, maybe desire is the figure that you're talking about. Like the maybe desire is is a is a movement and a space in which like these dynamics can emerge. They, they are not born, of course, but yeah, maybe they emerge because of desire, that's what I'd say. Yeah, I think you reach a, um, a very crucial point about desire, because I think that aura is all a matter of desire also. There's a desire of, um, um, there's a desire in what they in any sense to feel the authentic, he can hear just, but the, the desire of, um, of facing this emotion is also nourished by the familiarity of the, the simulacre of this uh, entity. 
So, I mean, the, the aura is also constructed through reproduction and through traces. Because, um, for example, if you, if you see um, a painting, a very famous painting, like a Turner one, through books, when you are a scholar, when you are, um, whether you are in a tourist <coughs> book or something, and, and so you face it in the museum, to have this feeling of aura because you, your, your gaze was attuned and so you had this, this desire in your mind of facing the real one. And so for, um, for another case, um, um, yeah, I, it's at the very heart of my thesis, my little begin thesis, and I would like to, yeah, to see the, the desire effect of aura and how the origin come from. But I think it's a very subjective, also a very subjective way, because um, maybe you can feel an aura to um, for someone or for an object, for especially in the definition for um, a place. The place is not alive, so you you have your own subjective projection of this place. Maybe the Fontaine de Trévise, um, you know, for Marcello Mastroianni. Uh, when you face it, you realize that um, your attuned gaze, your, your projection, you carry on your own encyclopedia, go through this um, materialization of, of uh, the, the place. And so, yeah, it's uh, always a kind of dynamic of disappearing, disappearance, trace, desire to capture this very own emotion of yourself, thanks to your attuned projection. I'm clear. Yeah. Okay. Uh, yeah, I have uh, a consideration uh, on, on this uh, subject and then two questions. Very simple because it's not me, it's uh, Michael uh, Sinatra who is uh, <laughs> tweeting me to. So the questions of Michael are, are oh clear and my commentary will not be clear. So uh, I start with my commentary, which is about this thing of desire. I think. Um, what is interesting in, in what you are saying about desire is that is um, uh, a way to uh, avoid this opposition between authenticity and artifice is uh, to, uh, to uh, adopt a non-essential point of view, uh, which means relations are uh, come before, if you can say that, not in a chronological sense, but in an uh, ontological sense, before uh, things. So you don't have this opposition between a subject and an object, uh, uh, and the gaze uh, actually, there's no gaze, there is just relations, and, uh, and because the gaze, the idea could be, there is an object uh, looking at uh, something else. So I don't know, my, my question at the end of this comment uh, would be uh, how, is it desire um, or or just relations? Uh, because <laughs> desire uh, means so uh, gives a, a sensual and in, in your presentation, certainly in what you analyzed, uh, there there was this sensual uh, or even erotic uh, for for uh, some of of uh, uh, the, the things you analyzed, um, but. Is it always like that, or we, we can have perhaps some uh, authentic artifice? So this atmosphere, uh, this relationship made atmosphere, can be other, uh, some something different from desire, just formal uh, relationships which are not involved in desire. So th th this is just uh, a question, and uh, just because uh, as a human being, uh, uh, must human being be at the center of this uh, atmosphere, or Perhaps not, and we can have uh, uh, machines having relationships uh, one with another without this uh, desire um, uh, centered uh, thing. But so, and the questions of Michael are uh, one for for uh, Elizabeth, uh, which is uh, uh, the biological. Uh, he wrote me in French. I don't know why. Um, <laughs> <laughs> the uh, l'artifice biologique vis-à-vis uh, uh, -vis de la science. Uh, duplication d'un corps par Hugh Jackman. Ouais. Uh, 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 Biologic uh, artifice, uh, les deux jumeaux uh, dans le film, ouais. uh, okay. versus uh, scientific artifice. Is there ouais. a difference between one and another? And the other question is for Charlotte. 
uh, and there's a question about uh, archiving uh, this uh, this uh, um, uh, and so uh, the question is uh, how can we imagine uh, an archive on of the performance like that of an exposition like that maybe i can just uh, begin um I'm not really answer answering the question but um in fact i think i think what we have in, in common is we're trying to because the, the question of authentic artifice is quite an ontological question and i think we try to get over this ontological question um, the most important things in my talk was not retromediation but more anamorphosis and Elizabeth talked about disparation, apparition, and we're trying to um, to find a way to problem, but not in just an ontological way. So trying to get over it. I, I think it's something very important. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> okay. So hi, Michael. Thank you for your question. <laughs> um, yeah, uh, I said there's a huge difference between uh, Borden and Angier's strategies, and Angier is the big loser in this in in this uh, this movie because he didn't find a good ethical way to um, to get rid of his self or to to. Um, uh, this uh, well, yeah, yeah he did, he didn't know how to to go on with the dissolution of, of himself uh, he went with the scientific uh, exploration and and that brings a lot of ethical issues um within the media of magic because he pretends that is not true what is true but that is what Borden does. Um, like taking this this difference uh, into consideration, I'd say Borden found a way to cope with the cyclic time of representation. He found a way to not only um, not only be able to uh, perform the return of the same, but to perform kind of a, a return. I return to the origin, but to the plural origin um, for each representation. But that's not what Andrew could do. Andrew, you're laughing in my face. <laughs> Stop. So Andrew. <laughs> Stop tweeting. <laughs> so Andrew uh, just produces more and more bodies. And at the end, like he he loses everything. I, I I don't really know if I'm answering the question, but like the answer is yes. There's a difference between <laughs> their strategies, like a huge difference, and the ethical issues are 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 there. <laughs> oh, oh my god. Okay. <laughs> okay. Um, yes. Hi, Michael. Thank you for the question. A tricky one. Um, yes. Um, I'm not an expert on uh, on VR archive and VR just right away, um, but it reminds me the um, the approach of Björk, in fact, because she she say that she's still conscious that uh, her approach. Of, um, of technology and of this VR um, album is still uh, very avant-garde for mm -hmm. our practices and the uh, habits of vision. I'm reading at the same time because I, I don't, I, I use the, the chemin. So um, um, yeah, they, they are even um, not yet really affordable. I mean, not everyone can, can pay for an Oculus Rift or have access to um, an Oculus Rift because it's still expensive. And um, yeah, this technology is not very uh, democratical. And um, so she used the museum as a, uh, as a kind of place of meeting, an accessible place for um, um, uh, have access to this technology. And this technology can 
have access to ourselves. And the museum also nourished the idea of our uh, so technology fascination. But at the same time, because it's an, it's in fact it's an album, it's a musical experience. So it has to be also democratic, and um, so this is why I think she also in parallel put that on YouTube, on her YouTube channel. Not every content, but most of them. And so because if um, if uh, one day you are lucky enough to have an Oculus Rift or any technology that permits this uh, three uh, hundred sixty degree experience. You can have this at home into um, um, a song or <clears throat> on your um, vinyl or, or CD or whatever you are using now. I think it, it's a, but I don't know really how to answer to the museum part of mm. conservation, preservation. I, I, I don't really know what the technical. Yeah, I guess you were the first, but I think you raised. Thank you for your three talks that were brilliant, actually. <laughs> um, my question slash comment, brief comment, as you say, uh, is for Charlotte. Um, you just said that this was a musical experience, that this was in some way comparable to listening to something in your own room or whatever. And what struck me in your presentation, your presentation, sorry, was the kind of dichotomy be between the other presence of bodies and what you've shown us, and the absence of the notion of the body in the conceptual tools you used, and everybody uses them, to uh, consider VR. For example, um, one quote was talking about okay, well, the weird relationship between camera and viewer. And I think that this paradigm is not um, operant. It doesn't work anymore for VR because there is no camera, no viewer. And then you are not in a situation of being in front. That, that was what Marcelo was saying when he was talking about the point of view. Point of view. You are not, um, it was the same, uh, uh, I was thinking about the anamorphosis mm -hmm. about the, the position that you, the body position that you have to adapt to, uh, to see something. And in a way, VR, I think, must be understood as you in the VR. You must think yourself as a, I don't remember who said it because I'm like a shitty memory. Anyway, uh, <laughs> but you must consider yourself. Too. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. Feel less alone. Uh, <laughs> as an experiencer and not as a viewer. I thought it was in a way paradoxical because you talk about the first age of cinema. And you showed us a picture of somebody looking into something, somebody involving his body into the, the act of looking. And I think it's a bit paradoxical. And the, the paradox is the paradox of the presence that you were underlining at the end of your presentation. I, I don't know. Maybe it's, it's, it's more of a, a comment than a question. Sorry, I'm doing like everything from the thing that every academic researcher does. I'm sorry for that. Uh, <laughs> but maybe this. This paradox of the presence relies on this dichotomy between the conceptual notions that we have and the, the experience that we have of the real thing of the VR. So maybe if you have, if you would expand on that, on the notion of presence, I would be thinking about the this bioregional and all that. So maybe if you have some answers, I'm happy to hear that because I'm as well. Wow. Yeah. <laughs> Sorry, that was awesome. <laughs> I'm also um, striving with the notion, uh, the evolution of the notion of um, spectatorship. Because um, um, I think that most of the experience tend to both on one side um, connect with our affects, emotion and, and vividness of our body, but in the same times um, they dematerialize or um, our body. I mean, there is, um, and Philippe uh, is working on that uh, with the GoPro things, etc. So we kind of delegate our gaze to a machine, but at the same time, this machine is um, here to fill us 
um, present in a physical way. So there's a kind of, um, yeah, indeed discrepancy. And I'm glad that you note that because um, I also had this feeling when I, 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 I finished this exhibition, I was mad. <laughs> I mean, I say, well, I, 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 I submitted this subject and, and what the hell I will do? Like, what, what, what can I say about that? Because I, I had this same frustration of uh, absence of body. And um, yet um, I say, okay, let's start to think a little bit about that and all this paradox. And yes, there's, um, I think we, we reach the same point, um, you and me, and I think the other also. And um, yeah, I don't know really how to answer you because I don't um, have enough background of the, you know, on this problematic. Um, but maybe we can talk uh, about that uh, maybe in three, five years. Thank you. Thank you. Yes, my question is for you. Oh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so, um, my question is about the virtual reality experience. Is is there something really important with the simultaneity? The simultaneity. Well, yeah, that word. Simultaneity. Yeah. <laughs> Between the spaces, the virtual space you experience with your vision and the real space, the physical space you create with your body also. Um, so my, my question is, because your the experience is set in a museum and it's also on YouTube and you can access to that with a very cheap device made of cardboard, like Google Cardboard thing, you can just use your 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 phone to to watch it i was wondering if you if you thought about the context and the effect of the context of the space the muse, uh, the museum space uh, has certainly a meaning an effect on the experience and if the experience is the same or if it's altered by uh, not altered but influenced by the, the experience you can have at home with youtube I'm coming. <laughs> yes, it's a, it's a very good uh, point um, uh, for the museum. I think the, 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 the experience in the museum is uh, particular because, as I said um, just before, there's a neurotic uh, things about being in, in such a place, a memory place, a, sh um, a meditating place, mm -hmm. and a shared space. So it's a kind of, um, it's a, a unique, it's an event in itself, in fact, because it's like an encounter, an encounter, an encounter, an encounter, an encounter um, <laughs> with, the, with um, um, the artwork, because you know that it's in this place and you won't find it after this place or elsewhere. But in this specific case um, of uh, VR uh, experience, VR, uh, VR experience, you can meet in another form, another context, this um, this uh, artwork, some of them. Mm -hmm. Like you can also find Björk in different context, in a different time, whether different photos, different video clips, uh, different totally uh, metamorphosis. Uh, and so it's a specific encounter with a concert with uh, the museum and it's and also more intimate because she she begins with the notion of intimacy also for the vr it's a one-on-one -on -one or a thousand of people in concert so the one-on-one -on -one experience it's like when you hear your favorite music or your favorite um, comfort album uh, for your own because Music is also about that. Art is also about that. It's it's about appropriation. So it's about sharing and appropriation. And I think that um, the the notion of um, it's it's a very I think it's she 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 pointed on a very good um, 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 approach for both the oratic museum and the oratic trace or oratic kind of. Um, 
reach an, um, this experience by yourself at home. Uh, this is actually a question to one of the questions about uh, the viewer and the, 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 there is the viewer and there is on camera this comment. So I was thinking yeah, about sure that. that. Yeah, because I was thinking, I mean, this material is really filmed even if digi digitally, and even the most animated ones are probably able motion capture and so on. So, so, so the camera part, and, but but the more intriguing part is maybe that there is a viewer. That this would be the viewer. So how how how? <laughs> I, I was, how do I was the person to to replace the world viewer. That's a, yes. I suppose is a um, specific point of view. Yeah. That's your body. Mm -hmm. um, most of the time, uh, like a couple, I really love to do that. When you're in a situation of contemplation, what I was noting was in the quote, the fact that. I don't remember, but it was qualified weird. Mm. But what's weird is that you're not a viewer in front of something. You are, in a way, you are the camera. You are operating the camera movement mm. into the work of art, or whatever you call it. And that's what I was trying to. to <laughs> but I, I, I struggle with that too, with this idea, because but when I said there is no camera and there is no viewer, like we have a punchline as well, and then it was I was talking from a, a reception point of view, mm -hmm. not a poetic one, one of one of the one. Of course, you've got a camera. Of course, you've got point of views. Even if you're doing like a, a digital work, you have to kind of arrange your angles and all that. Of mm -hmm. course, you've got and to create a three sixty degrees. That's a lot of work. And okay, but for from a reception. It's, Weird feeling that you're the camera, and uh, at, a you're from, at the same time you're very connect away. Sometimes you're, as Charlotte said, you're like disembodied, and it's a kind of fantomatic phantom thing. It's, it's, it's a ghostly thing. Uh, uh, rapport <laughs> to yourself. It's not uh, a rapport. <laughs> I'm sorry, I don't English right. Uh, that you have when you're in front of something, and. And I think it has to do with how you perceive your body because, but I could go on and on for hours, I'm sorry with that, but you use the term immersion. And what fascinates me in term immersion is that if you take the, the term at the first sense, like there is water, there is your body, and you're immersed, or a body, even if you're, if you're, you're immersed. And, and I, I struggle with those kind of exceptions. We all struggle with that. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> it, it begins to, to, to sound like a, like an like anonymous feeling, like we all struggle. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> I understand you. Yeah, I, I feel, feel, you know. feel, you know. <laughs> there, okay, we have two. Quick comment to this. There, there, there's <laughs> also an interesting tension between the, I mean, the, the you operate the camera, but you do it within a very predefined set of mm -hmm. parameters and a sort of predefined space also. So there is a tension between the illusional freedom that you have and the, the authentic artifice of freedom, so to speak, within the virtual reality. So, so. Okay, we have two last questions or comments. First, you behind and so, thank you. I, I only um, came in for the second two presentations, but um, I came in for five years this back here while we're talking about Christy. Can then, you talk a bit louder, please? Really? Yeah. I'll project. Um, and uh, the uh, it made me realize that magic. Uh, might be a place, might be the site or the um, atelier where we can consider the philosophical question of disappearance. Because magic has an answer to the old uh, philosophical riddle about who disappears, where does it go? In magic, you can consider where it goes when it disappears. If things do go to somewhere, then they disappear in magic, I suppose, whether they remain the same thing. But I was also thinking about disappearance uh, in relation to Bjork, and I just wonder. Um, if it might be also to do with her ability or inability to, to disappear. And I'm thinking about that in relation to her fame. I'm not a New York expert, but I remember two things about her, which is that she was a child star um, and has spoken about the problems of being famous for your entire life. She had a fan who killed himself, and she was very understandable. By that, and I just wonder if uh, she is 
using the virtual to deal with her inability to disappear in the face of her fans, in the face of that gaze. Um, and he's doing a, a version of a, a way of, he's trying a way of managing the problem of fame, which you can see the, the more kind of, uh, already examined example of that might be somebody like Bob Dylan, who in a very different way does something I think is similar, which is to say he He's a kind of good psychoanalyst, or at least a Lacanian psychoanalyst, in that he knows that the only thing he can ethically do with his audience is to make them think about who he is that they are interrogating. Who is it that you want me to be? And what, what are you doing? So he returns and says, and maybe Bjork is doing a very different version of that through the virtual, to exploring the impossibility of that encounter and her inability to disappear. Fame. I thought about this face and um, you're right. <laughs> it's interesting because like in the different uh, modalities of disappearance that I I analyzed, um the magical show is the only one that produced this space. And that's why I called it a very conflictual space because um, in the prestige, it's interesting because when you see that space, you die. Like a character discovers a, the secret, uh, he finally dies. And, and I, I guess that's why Angier at the end, he has a blind machinist, like blind uh, employees. So, so they don't die because they don't, they don't see that space. And uh, so yeah, it's a very conflictual space that that helped me to to see all the the paradoxes and the oscillations and like it's it's uh, it's the complex space where where there's time where like time plays uh, a huge role and and it's that space where something is distracted and something is created. But what's uh, What's interesting too is that this space lasts forever. Like there's no, like I, I said in, in my speech, there's no end to disappearance. So you create a space that lasts forever with all of this uh, conflictual uh, elements. Uh, yeah, so and and uh, yeah, actually, all my dissertation is like constructed like a magic turn because I, I I understood that it's um vanishing tours uh, tricks uh, is a very very nice paradigm to to understand what what can be at stake with uh, with disappearance in a larger uh, larger perspective um, um concerning your observation about the um, notoriety of Björk Central. So thank you for that. Um, as I mentioned, in fact, uh, the, um, the, I think that the, the aura um, is, a, is also constructed. It's, a, it's constructed through recurrence. So uh, the recurrence of um, the simulacre, um, the, the traces. And so we are attuned to see Björk um, within a different context, within different transformation, but we all we always recognize her, and she plays with this kind of hide and seek uh, uh, aura because it's a kind of mystic play. It's something you you instantly feel of this uh, specific face and presence, and uh, and yeah, she even even in the disappearance of VR. She, she, as an avatar, is also recognizable through the specific um, face form and, uh, and also the voice. The voice is uh, her um, proper identity and she plays with the different um, uh, um, body she can uh, embody with the same voice. This is why I, I also put it, um, um, I have for memory also, so I have to. Um, yes, Mathieu Guillaume, uh, who say that uh, we we could uh, we could imagine something. We 
we should separate the voice and the body to have um, a single uh, to give a single entity to the voice and so she she would be no more dependent to one body and so it's exactly what Bjork tried to do and play with us with that with this hide and seek uh, but she's famous since her very young age so we always have this connection with her and she plays with that whether she's half cyborg whether she's um, like you and me it's um it's a part of her art in fact so thank you for mentioning okay so we now come to our last question there. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> thank you very much for Charlotte.